small introduction who I am. Um, so my name's Ed Schouten. I'm an, like an open source activist fan from the Netherlands. I started using Linux uh, back in 2002, 2003, and also uh, switched over to using FreeBSD later on. Um, in 2008, I was sending so many patches over to the FreeBSD people that I eventually uh, gained SVN access or CVS access back then. And uh, I've been a developer ever since. Um, when I went to the uh, BSD conference, BSD CAN in Canada in 2009, I got really interested in, to, in one of the talks that was given by Chris Latner, who then had recently started working for Apple on um, LVM Clang, their new C++ C++ compiler. Um, being one of the first people to actually start using Clang on FreeBSD, I also became a, an LVM developer, something that also stuck around for a long time. Um, in 2012, I graduated, got my master's degree, which basically meant that um, I didn't do a lot of open source hacking afterwards because I, uh, I was swallowed by a company in Germany <laughs> and uh, worked there for a couple of years. And um, as of 2015, so last year, I started my own company in the Netherlands where I'm de developing a tool called Cloud ABI. Before I'm going to explain what Cloud ABI is, I am um, going to sort of... Um, mention what I think is sort of wrong with, with Unix-like operating systems. You know, I've been using them for, yeah, 14 years now in total, and I've actually used them quite a lot to develop my own applications, you know, both for university assignments, but also professionally. You know, after some time, you really start sort of noticing the, the, the things that are sort of wrong in its design. And my observations are that, um, so just looking at Unix-like systems in general, so this could be Linux, could be BSD, could be Solaris, it doesn't really matter. They all suffer from like the, 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 the same problems, and in my opinion those are that they don't really stimulate you to actually design applications that are like reusable and testable and secure. And of course this is a really bold claim, so over the next 10 to 15 minutes I actually want to like use this time to sort of really explain this in depth what, with what I mean with this. So first I'm going to focus on reusability and testability of applications that you build on Unix-like systems. So instead of really focusing, focusing on applications, let's first take a look at like, how people write reusable and testable code. So really, at, this could be at the, the, the C file level, at the class level, it, it doesn't really matter, but really at a lower level than entire programs. So um, there's this person called uh, Robert Cecil Martin, and um, most people who actually would know him here in this audience, they uh, probably know him from the Agile Manifesto. He was one of the co-authors of, uh, of that document explaining why you should be using like um, Agile as part of your projects as opposed to using things like a, a V model. But one of the other things that's really impressive that, or at least what I think is more impressive than the Agile Manifesto is that he once came up with the so-called solid principles. And there's even a, there's a Wikipedia article on what the solid principles um, are, uh, really are in detail, but it's basically just an abbreviation. So it's, uh, it's, it's five different rules, and if you stick to those five principles, then you end up writing code that is of higher quality. Well, um, so they claim. <laughs> so one of the letters in, in, in SOLID is, is D, and that one actually stands for the dependency inversion principle. And the way it's phrased is, um, it's phrased as depend upon abstractions, not, do not depend on concretions. And what is basically meant with this, and it's sort of fairly obvious if you think about this, if you're designing an application, you shouldn't really hard code on the things that you're depending on. So for example, your web application shouldn't be encoded in such a way that it can only talk to this one specific database that can hold your data. It should be written in such a way that it can talk to arbitrary databases behind it so you can easily reuse this. So really, um, you should be injecting your dependencies instead. The program by itself has no knowledge of what its database really is. It needs to be injected from the outside. So that's where the dependency inversion comes from. The arrows sort of port, uh, point backwards. You know, instead of the class pointing directly to the database server, it's like something the database server passed into the application or passed into the class. So just to make this a bit more obvious, I've just added a couple of slides of, of Java code. There won't be a lot more code like this in, in the slides, but it's, this is really just a prime example of what dependency injection is. So say you would write your own web application. You, know, you would be using the Java programming language to create your own class, 
And inside of this class, there's always this database connection that's being kept open to the outside world. Um, one of the worst ways you could implement this class is by doing it like this. Namely, whenever you're constructing one of those web applications, what you do is you create a database connection inside of it where you just say like, my database server that I want to use for this web, app for this web application is foo.com. We, we can all agree that this is really bad from like an administrative point of view. You know, especially considering that you have to recompile your program to make it use a different database server. So this is really the worst thing you can do. So what you see is that like a lot of people, they, they start writing this code instead. So instead of it like hard coding the host name that should be used, you just have a class that takes some kind of string host name and you know, you forward the string over to the constructor of the MySQL connection function and that way it can actually work on multiple database connections. But then the problem with this approach is that it's still fairly limited if you, you write code like this. And one of the reasons is, what if you want to use other attributes that you sort of have to set on this MySQL connection? For example, say you want to use a client-side certificate for making like an SSL connection over to this database server. There's no way that this API can do this. So instead of adding more and more and more arguments to this constructor and all forwarding them, them over to this MySQL connection, one thing that you should be doing instead is just make it more abstract in the sense that you pass in the database connection into the class and that's the one that's being used. And this is actually like the proper way to actually write sensible tests for your web application because what you can do is you can easily simulate requests going to this web application and actually capture the database um, queries that are being sent in. You create your own fake database connection class and every time this web application calls into it, you sort of have a check in there like, if this web app is executing this query, send back this fake data. And that way you can completely test like, if I'm using this fake database and I'm using this web app on top of it, then I get this resulting web page and fully test this. So this is really like, inside of like the software development, the proper way of testing, testing code. So now looking back at Unix programs, so no longer at individual classes or individual source files, but just entire Unix programs, my observation is that they are really like um, sort of the crappy written C++ code. Namely, they all hard code a lot of things that they shouldn't be doing. They should all be things that should be injected into the application. So it's also really hard to actually unlearn all those things uh, that the application does. So a really good example that I came up with is um, assume you're, you have a single application um, and what you want to do is, for example, um, a web browser and you actually want to test whether it works when you use different name servers. So you're running the browser on your computer, and next to it you want to start up an, a separate instance of the browser, but instead of using your own name servers that are specified in your system settings, you want to make it use different name servers instead. That's impossible in Unix, for the reason that all applications internally always open the same text file stored in slash EDC to obtain their name servers, and there's no per application way of overriding this in a, in a sane way. That's because they all have this built-in knowledge instead of it being passed into the application from the outside. Another good example is, say you have some kind of network service, could be a database server, could be a web server, could be a mail server, it doesn't really matter, and you want to start it up twice because you have separate customers, for example, or you have one staging, one production setup. Well, it turns out that that's also pretty hard on Unix, and what you basically see is that this entire market of tools has shown up, you know, virtual machine solutions or Vagrant where you can easily create testing setups or containers and they're all basically built on like, you know, Unix is horrible, it's, it's not testable, it's not reusable. Instead of really tackling it at the bottom, making Unix better, we're solving it by just putting it in boxes, putting shrink wrap around it. And that's basically my annoyance with Unix. And the problem with these approaches like virtual machines and containers is, First of all, they're not tackling the underlying problem, but they also reduce the transparently, uh, transparency of the system significantly. I've had an experience working at a company where we make really extensive use of virtual machines. And because they run on a host system, so there's like a Linux system that runs virtual machines also running Linux, you actually have to like debug multiple systems at the same time. Whenever there's a networking problem, you always have to take a look both at the virtual machines and at the host systems. Um, when there's performance issues, inside of a virtual machine, you really don't know, know why performance of your system is horrible. You have to look at the host system. It's because of this nesting that's going on that's actually, in theory, unnecessary. 
So um, that's why my claim is that those sort of, you know, the fact that Unix is so bad at writing reusable and testable applications, you actually see that for systems administrators it becomes a lot har harder and they need to make use of a lot more tools than strictly necessary. So now we're talking about security because this is a security conference. So um, just taking a look at your Linux or, yeah, for example, your Linux server, if you run a couple of applications on there like a web server and you want to harden this, there's a, there are a couple of tools out there that allow you to actually accomplish this. So you could, for example, start using SE Linux security policies or App Armor, and these systems are policy-based security frameworks. So what you do is you write a separate text file that sort of explains the behavior of this application, and when the process is then start up, it's confined to this to the the rules that are specified in this policy. So I've observed, like I've I've written some of those policies in the past. It's getting this right is really hard. Um, most of those security frameworks that actually make it, try to make it somewhat easier by having a, um, a learning mode. So you start up the application, you just run it for a couple of hours, couple of days, couple of weeks, and then after some time you sort of know which files it's going to access, you know which um, hosts on the network it's going to access, you sort of get a profile of what it's doing, and then you sort of tidy that up, you know, look through it and see whether it's all right, and then install that as your security policy. But the problem, there's a couple of problems with, with, with such a model. So first of all, it's, it's not dynamic. So whenever you're reconfiguring the application, you also need to make sure that you reprofile the application entirely. You have to discard your old profile. You know, in some cases you can still tune it, but if you're not unsure, the only thing you can do is discard it and start over again. Also, um, even if you keep it running for weeks in a row, how do you know that you've been running it for long enough? There could always be like one single action that your application hasn't made yet or one piece of code that hasn't been run during those couple of weeks. And once you install that security policy, it is going to backfire then because you know, you're suddenly going down different code paths. So one of the most severe things I've noticed is that if you start up an application that uses OpenSSL for its crypto and um, you forget to whitelist the random device, so you forget to whitelist access to dev u random or dev random, then what you see is that the crypto of the application suddenly becomes unsafe. OpenSSL just goes on, but it can't initialize its random number generator, meaning that it's going in this like, almost fully deterministic mode where all of the crypto that's being performed, performed is deterministic. So my idea is that dependency injection actually makes this really easy because the list of the dependencies that a program has, that is the security policy. You know, those are the things that it needs to, to, access, to use to access the outside world, and that's exactly what you want to encode in a security policy. So there's no need to have a learning mode, and best of all, using dependency injection for this purpose, it's guaranteed to be like the minimum uh, list of things that you need to have accessible to the application, but on the other hand, it's also the maximum, so it's really like an accurate policy of what should be used. So, you know, here in this case, think of this like these are Java classes again, the same as I showed on the, on the previous slides, but you know, just think of them as, as applications. You know, in this case, it's really judged from the outside, you know, just looking at the, the, the constructor of this class to, to guess what this thing is going to do internally. You won't know which host on the network it's going to access. But on, if you just look at this class instead, where you explicitly inject a database connection in it, it becomes really obvious how this class is communicating to the outside world. And that's something that, in my opinion, programs should also be doing instead. So now that I've sort of uh, rambled on about you know, software design, and let's just talk about Cloud ABI specifically, where Cloud ABI comes in. So Cloud ABI is a project I've been working on for the last yeah, one and a half years, um, not one and a half years full time, but I've been working on it off and on. And it's basically a new runtime environment for Unix-like operating systems. So what happens is that you sort of modify the operating system to not be able to only run Linux applications, so Linux being able to run Linux applications, but instead it can also run a second flavor of applications, you could call it, and those are Cloud ABI executables. So the file format of those executables is almost the same as traditional Linux executables. It's just ELF for people who have enough knowledge about this. But it's running in a separate, separately constrained environment that's different from traditional POSIX. 
And what it is, Cloud ABI, you could think of it as being Unix, but forcing the use of dependency injection. So programs have to be started up in such a way that all of the dependencies to the outside world are explicitly provided to the application in the form of file descriptors. So all of the APIs that conflict with this model, I've removed those, which means that a lot of software doesn't build anymore. But on the other hand, it also really makes it obvious where code needs to be modified in order to use this dependency injection. And it's also like, it's not incompatible with Unix or with POSIX, because what happens is, if you design an application to work well with Cloud ABI, you could, in theory, also just compile it for Linux and run it again, because it's almost entirely a subset of what you'd normally see on Linux. So the idea behind Cloud ABI is, by remo removing all of those conflicting APIs, you, you just end up with a really compact runtime environment. It really acts as a tool for guiding software engineers to write code that is clean in the sense that it uses dependency injection all over the place. So the nice thing about Cloud ABI is that it's secure by default in the sense that once you run a program and you don't provide it any file descriptors, you're just starting it up in the simplest form, the only thing it can do is just run. It can allocate some, some memory and then perform some computation, but nothing more. If you actually want to give this program meaning, what you do is you just inject those resources in the form of file descriptors. So by providing it file descriptors to network sockets, you can actually turn this into, for example, a web server, mail server, database server. If you provide the file descriptors to files or directories, then you can grant access to files or directories stored within. And this security model is typically called capability-based security. And Cloud ABI is sort of based on a system that's, that also tries to accomplish something similar called Capsicum, developed by the um, University of Cambridge. The only difference is that with Capsicum, they try to sort of make a two-state model where a program starts up like a normal Unix process but can call a special call to switch over to capabilities mode. Um, Cloud ABI is really sort of a clean slate environment where I try to trim off all of the ac access fat, so to speak, so you get like a tool that's sort of a lot easier to develop software for. So now I'm going to sort of um, um, show you what this looks like from like a configuration or usage perspective. So just consider that you have this, this, this web server. I always think that web servers are good examples of, um, of tools that can be sandboxed. Um, and this is just, it's not Nginx or Apache, just some fictive web server that we're just coming up with that has a configuration file that looks like this. So it's using sort of YAML as sort of a key value pair to, um, to list all the things that, that a web server needs to know in order to start. So this could, for example, be like string values, like what is my own host name whenever I'm printing a, like a HTTP error page? What is the host name that I should be printing in HTML output? Um, how large is the number of, like the, the worker pool of the number of threads that, that can pick up incoming requests, but also some other things that are actually descriptive about the environment in which this process is running. For example, what is the IPv4 address and port number on which I'm listening? What, what is my log file where I should write all of the, like the request logs? And what is the root directory where all the files are stored that I need to serve over the web? And what you do with Cloud ABI is that instead of using a file format like this, you sort of annotate it in a bit. Namely, instead of having sort of the IP addresses, file names all specified as strings that sort of lose their meaning when they're sent over to the process, you really sort of annotate them saying like, you know, this is not just a string saying 148251, et cetera. This is really a socket. This is a web server that wants to bind on this IP address and port number. And the same holds for file system access. And what happens then is that this um, tool, Cloud ABI Run, which I'll show in a couple of slides from now, will just sort of pre-process this file, acquire all those resources on your behalf. So Cloud ABI Run is a traditional Unix program that parses the config file for you, acquires all the sockets, opens all the files, directories, and then alters the configuration to sort of say this, like, you know, instead of giving the exact IP address and port number over to the application, it gives you the file descriptor instead. So um, there's also an API for accessing that data then from within the program. So instead of having the traditional Unix prototype for you know, starting up processes written in C, there's now a different one that has some accessor functions, but I'm not going to talk about that too much right now. But then you can simply just start the program like this, Cloud ABI dash run, specifying it the name of the executable that you want to start and then specifying the configuration file. 
And in this case, this configuration file really shares two purposes. It's both the actual you know, traditional config for the application specifying how the application should behave, but at the same time, this is also the security policy. So it means that you sort of get extra security in your application, something that it's almost impossible to sort of get on traditional Unix systems without spending any additional effort. You know, this is pretty easy to, to do as a, as a user, just putting a config in a text file and saying just run this program with this config. So now, um, just the last couple of slides of my presentation, uh, a couple of random things that are useful to mention. So Cloud ABI is cr cross-platform. Uh, the, the binaries that you get from Cloud ABI are the same across every platform. So you can compile software in your MacBook, run the tests there, and then um, run it on your Linux servers. Um, there's support for a couple of operating systems. FreeBSD support is even upstream, so FreeBSD 11 that came out recently supports this out of the box. There's support for multiple hardware platforms ranging from server CPU architectures to embedded architectures. So there's 64-bit Intel, uh, but also um, uh, the 64-bit uh, ARM, and also the 32-bit flavors of those. And there's also uh, a huge set of software that we've already ported. So there's crypto libraries, frameworks like Boost, a lot of um, audio, graphics, video libraries that you can already use, and you can write your sandbox code in C, C++, Python, and, well, yeah, Lua. So what does Nuxi do as a company here? So one of the things that we, uh, we want to make sure is that this sort of remains open in the sense that it's such a nifty tool for writing sandbox software. It shouldn't be something that's only used by a very small number of people. So, you know, the goal behind the company is just to make sure that Cloud ABI remains available as an open source uh, uh, platform that people can all use. And, well, um, as a company, we offer things like training, courses, and workshops on how to use cl Cloud ABI, commercial support. Say you want to know how your application should be ported over to Cloud ABI, there's always uh, ways to get in touch with us. So that's all I have to say about Cloud ABI. Here's a couple of useful links. So there's uh, at the top the, the, the page of uh, Nuxi where there's more information about Cloud ABI. And also the bottom two links is where development takes place and where discussion regarding the development takes place. So that's, uh, that's all I have to say. Are there any questions from the audience? You've described how cool your uh, ABI is, but uh, can you show any example of real code, how, how the code gonna looks like? Um, well, yeah, so, so the problem is uh, normally I'd be, pre be presenting this on my, uh, on my own laptop, uh, and then I'd be able to run some really nice demos. Um, if you go to nuxi.nl, there is, um, uh, like, right in the middle of the page, there's a YouTube player of a previous talk I gave at the CCC conference in Hamburg, so the Chaos Computer uh, Club conf conference. And that um, uh, presentation is, is longer. Uh, I had, like, one hour to give a talk there, and that includes more demos or more, you know, actual pieces of code that show how to use